This man had governed one of Britain's top sports for over two decades. He had attracted millions of pounds in sponsorship and led Britain to world domination. But by 1993, times were changing. He had done a wonderful job. It was time to go, but he wouldn't go. He's a bit of a vindictive man. And I know, mate, because nobody knows him better than me. Develop something for 20 years and then just give it away like that. And you, I could see my officials allowing me to do that. <laughs> oh, dear me. <laughs> Uh, just give way, just give it to them, yeah. <laughs> As Ollie Croft clung to power, the game he loved split in two, setting player against player and plunging them all into one of the most poisonous civil wars in the history of British sport. Only a few years earlier, it had all been going so well for darts. Wow, that's that's right. that is smooth. The game had created some of the most unlikely of superstars. And it was even challenging football as Britain's most popular TV sport. With darts, it's one against one. All oh, these 11 men chasing around, that's fine if you're a fanatic man. But this is the classic confrontation. This is the guy with the spear against the guy with the sword. And who's better? Someone has to be better. Bullseye to go out in style and take the open. Yes! Yay! That's the right goal! Yes! It's there! Yes! That's the awesome. They are both trained. The emotion comes up. The heroes of this British pub game were sporting titans recognised all over the world and fully expecting an Olympic future. Eric Christophe! He's gone good. He likes the odd pint and the odd bag. He's the star. But all this was only possible because 20 years earlier, a young Ollie Croft had noticed something extraordinary happening in his local pub in Muswell Hill. At 9 o'clock, everyone in the pub stopped talking. They all come round the dartboard, watch, I thought, well, all of a sudden, I thought, well, there's something in this. Everyone in the pub come round and watch a dart match. From that moment on, Ollie and his wife Lorna dedicated their lives to turning a pub game into a major amateur sport through the British Darts Organisation. Then, in the late 1970s, they chanced across a teenage phenomenon who would change the entire destiny of the game. Sometimes a, a lovely looking girl comes into a room and you see the gentlemen turn their heads, you know. It was similar to Eric. I mean, if you, you'd know Eric would, was in the, come in the place. We just got on very well. I mean, it was the heart of the game. We used to go around their house, we used to have a laugh. I mean, it was like a mum and dad to me. I was around there all the time. You know I mean, they were good friends of mine. He was a natural, wasn't he? Yeah. He was just a natural good dark player. He was very arrogant. We loved no, him, but, was... but we loved him, but we did certain things we didn't like what he did, you know. But that's, but that's, that's life. life. That's life. It? I suppose I was a bit of a character, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, I just said what I thought. I thought I was going to win it, so I told everybody. So I suppose, yeah, I suppose I was a bit outspoken, but I uh, didn't tell a lot of lies, did I? I just said what I felt. With Eric on board, the game's popularity soared. Top players turned professional. TV audiences rocketed to over 10 million, and the broadcasters couldn't get enough. It seemed to grow every year. And, and there were some lovely friends in the B, weren't there? Oh, well, that's right, ITV yeah. And, yeah. You know, we, yeah. we sort of... Uh, Very exciting things. times. From his headquarters in Muswell Hill, Ollie found himself in charge of a multi-million pound sport. Wow, that's that's right. that is... Darts fever gripped the nation. 
manufacturers couldn't produce boards fast enough. And sponsors were queuing up to pour money into the game. After long years spent training in local pubs, dart players were now professional sportsmen, earning big money and living like stars. I didn't believe I'm coming back again, see? I'm only here once and I'll have a good time. Whether I've done right or wrong, we'll find out later on in life, I suppose, I don't know. But at the very moment the sport of darts was toasting its success, it was also unwittingly sowing the seeds of its own destruction. How many pints would you have during a, a fairly tense game? Well, oh, it depends. Five or six pints or like I mean, even when you're on the television? Yeah. How can you see the board? <laughs> it's a funny old game. It's a funny old game. <laughs> Suddenly, the press was full of lurid tales about darts players' drinking habits. It all seemed so unfair. You can't play darts and be drunk. Or, or if you go to the top and drink and you cannot play darts properly. I mean, let's face it, the, the press will pick on anything anyway. Yeah. OK, then, if people do drink a lot of beer, maybe some people do get beer bellies, some people don't. But you'll find, as far as the dart players are concerned, they do eat a lot because they've got to eat. They take a lot out of themselves especially in competitive darts, they need to have a meal and have a drink after. The same as what you would do if he's playing rugby. Out of the way. With the media on the attack, players like Jockey Wilson made strenuous efforts to show the healthy, wholesome side of darts. Another six, nine months, I could probably got rid of my pot belly. But there's bloody knack on me. <laughs> but they were fighting a losing battle. Broadcasters were soon threatening to take the game off their squeaky clean TV channels. As the crisis deepened, Ollie received an offer of help from one of Britain's top sports PR men. Marcus Robertson had a passion for darts and thought he could bring journalists back on side. We felt very strongly that the game needed direction on its image and we were very very keen to do that for Ollie. Marcus prepared a plan that would relieve Ollie of his PR burden but Ollie and Lorna smelt a rat. When we went and presented they were extremely disinterested and almost hostile to it and I think felt that we were looking to take over the game in some way which was a long long way from the truth. Marcus I, I would... It's not, not respected. Isn't it? No, he, he, I wouldn't, um, <laughs> it would get on people's nerves a lot. Marcus was politely shown the door. Ollie and Lorna mistakenly thought it was the last they would see of him. He was a different class of person to us. The dark people are very down-to-earth people, aren't they, Ollie? Yeah. They the need down-to-earth people that, to deal with. Are you with me? Ollie was always very, very suspicious of anything that would possibly mean losing a little bit of control over the entire product. Ollie was sure he could handle a few negative headlines without Marcus. But he and Lorna were to prove helpless in the face of the media attack, before which all other attacks would pale into insignificance. Game on. So it's fat belly to go first. And it's a good start. <laughs> Double vodka. <laughs> Single pint. <laughs> Another double vodka. Clearly it was a, a clever sketch, but it was depressing because one knew that it would just reinforce all the prejudices that people had about the game. <laughs> and he's missed the table altogether. He's missed the table. 
110 milligrams. That's just 110. What an unfortunate miss. Still two triple <laughs> Bacardis. It was not something that you could you could sort of just sort of sweep under the carpet and say, well, we'll we'll, we'll soon get rid of this. This is going to go away. He's gone for a triple scotch. That'll help. That'll keep him in the game. And oh, would you believe it? It went in, but it's come out again. It's come out again. Every walk of life, there's large and small people. Why should it be? Because there's large and small people in the darts fraternity, why should it be different to the other walks of life? But apparently, it was. By 1988, darts was out of fashion. Broadcasters decided they wanted to wash their hands of five pints a night superstars. The BBC cut everything except one tournament a year, the Embassy Championship, and ITV axed its entire darts coverage. All of a sudden they said, right, we're not going to run it no more. Uh, why? You know what I mean? Who comes up with it? TV, why do they just cut it like that? For players who had given up promising careers to turn professional, the long, wild dance of darts was over. Their despair was disappointing to Ollie, but for him the game did not live or die by television. He was still running 800 amateur tournaments a year in all kinds of places. As far as the British Darts Organisation was concerned, I mean, we continued with running events, with, with um, weekend events with Pontins and Haven and Butlins and, you know, them. so, I mean, we, we were still very, very busy. We were still promoting darts in a big way. For Ollie, the soul of the game lay not so much with the stars, but with his organisation's 30,000 amateur members. They were like a family to him. Darts is full of some, so many nice people. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, they you, are. You get, they, they really appreciate. It. You're surprising me when you're at a tournament, and then, oh, fantastic! A lovely time. We lost the first round, but I've had a lovely time. You know. Being part of a family, however, wasn't good enough for the top professionals. Mike Gregory. With no sign of a TV revival, they were scratching out a living in pub competitions. Oh, it was it was terrible at the time. You didn't know where he was coming and going, where the next penny was going to come from, whether you were in tournaments, at tournaments. By 1993, Mike Gregory and the other professionals had spent five years in the shadows. <laughs> Ollie, they decided, had not done enough to get darts back on the box. Top 32 players in the world sat around a table and we said to Ollie Croft, can you guarantee us more than one tournament a year on TV? And he said no. We said OK. Would you mind if we run our own tournaments on TV? Because not only just the players, the players managers, the dart manufacturers, everybody who do with darts was getting a bit worried. So that's who we was representing. And they said, yes, we do mind if you run your own tournaments on TV. in pocket. We don't owe anyone a living. What we, we don't actually employ dart players and owe them a living. Ollie's amateur competitions, however, offered the top professional players precious little. Slowly it dawned on them there was no longer a choice. They had to set up their own separate organisation. And they found just the right people to help them. Spurned PR man Marcus Robertson would handle the media, and top darts manager Tommy Cox 
would be a far better frontman than Ollie Croft. Ollie's ability, thinking, and everything else with the game had become stale. He would not bring in any marketing people, he would not bring in any specialised television people, he would not bring in any PR, he thought that PR was a total waste of money. He, he didn't try to do anything, nor did he think that he had to. He didn't think that he had to justify himself to us in any shape or form. He does treat the sport as his own crown jewels and his family's own crown jewels, and that's the problem. The stage was now set for a major confrontation and Tommy chose the 1993 Embassy Championship, Ollie's last remaining TV tournament, as the battleground. We were looking to show the BBC in particular and, and television in general that there was another organisation there um, which had most the support of most of the professionals, the top professionals, and this was the only showcase we had. Tommy's top players arrived at the tournament, their hearts emblazoned on their sleeves. Their new organization, the WDC, or World Darts Council, needed to get noticed. And if they stole the British darts organization's limelight, so much the better. We were very optimistic. And every single previous world champion would be wearing a WDC badge rather than a BDO badge. Didn't think they'd have that cheek to do it. Honestly, didn't think they'd have that cheek to do it. The event that we're talking about now, I mean, that has been going for 18 years, and there's been a PDO promoted event since day one. And a, a few players come along, and a few managers want to come along and take control of it. Well, I mean, it, it automatically you you, you wouldn't you wouldn't allow that. He just flatly said, "It's advertising. You're not wearing it." I turned on my heel, I said, you will never ever do this again to us, Ollie. Never again. And walked out. Ollie had won the first leg. The WDC would get no television publicity at all. And the debadged. Eric turned to fury uh, because he knew um, what exactly was happening and he knew that they were laughing up the sleeves at us. You can't tell Ollie anything, mate. He wants to bat the ball and everything. It's his. Darts is his game. You're just an individual. Don't worry about you. You could drop down to dead tomorrow. That's the way you look at it. Darts will carry on. Us 32 players, we're just dart players. Don't worry about you. Sod you. That was his attitude. Sad, isn't it? No doubt about it, they brought it onto themselves completely. No doubt about it at all. Ollie thought he had seen off the WDC. In fact, he had fueled their resentment. The humiliated players were now ready to take the dispute much further. To them, it wasn't just about badges. It was about the destiny of darts. Marcus's PR machine now struck back with a press conference at the Rose and Thistle in Frimley. There, Britain's top players held a gun to Ollie's head. Unless he agreed to recognize the WDC, they would boycott the next embassy tournament. You come to the crossroads in life and you've got to take left or right, haven't you? And, then, and it had to be done because it, it was... It, 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 didn't really, it wasn't like... Difficult for, I suppose it was difficult for me personally wise because I, I was very friendly with them, but I mean it was for the good of the game that I love and that's more important than just one individual, isn't it? Oh, big shot. Yeah, very hurtful. Very hurtful. 
in actual fact, he came up to me at that particular on the Sunday he left on that particular week. You know when they decided what they was going to do, he said to me, "Whatever happens, he said that well, I hope it doesn't affect our relationship." And I and I haven't uh, I've only seen him once ever since then. I've seen him a couple of times since. He don't look me in the eye anymore. He used to, I look him straight in the eye. I look him straight in the eye and smile. And then here you go like that. And that's sad. That's sad. Because we were right and he was wrong. He can cut it any way he likes. He was wrong. So unjust and so unfair. We was close friends to a lot of them, you know. We took the world with a lot of the Yeah, they could do that to us. It, We've lived in the same hotel, the same in the venue, day after day, all over the world. And all of a sudden, they've they. And I thought, well, Ollie's given his life to them. Uh, if they were heartbroken, then suggest that um, they were being very naive if they thought they could just uh, throw things one way and expect nothing to come back. There was no stopping the WDC now. Tommy had struck a deal to produce their first tournament for a local TV company. Top car manufacturer Larder agreed to sponsor it and players were back on screen, if only in East Anglia. It was good because we all we all stuck together and we all done we all done things we would never have done which like officials would have done. We got dark players doing it and making sure it was done right. I well, won two events out of four. Um, they were quite good. I really enjoyed them actually. I wouldn't give them titles away if anybody asked me, even though it's ladder. You know what I mean? What they say about ladders, it's not true by the way. We had a great um, sense of achievement when it was finished and we proved beyond doubt that we could put a tournament on. Tommy thought he had Ollie over a barrel. His players were still threatening to boycott the next embassy championship. Surely Ollie would want to do a deal. Remember that we had every world champion from 1973 to the present standing there four square with us so that it seemed inconceivable that the tournament could go out without these players being in it. Sure enough, an invitation from the BDO arrived. Tommy and Marcus decided that, with a smart presentation, they could win over the delegates. They would argue that two organisations were better than one. We were ushered through the crowd to complete silence at that time. And it was quite a big room and possibly a hundred and odd people in there. They looked confident that they, they had a, a presentation that, that, that would be at least considered. I went in there with a lot of optimism and felt that our case, if you like, was, was very um, cogent. There was plenty of good in it for them, for the game. As the meeting began, it seemed that Ollie was taking a back seat. Ollie took a very, very low profile during the meeting, probably because he needed both hands free to pull the strings. Tommy rose to speak. What would the BDO make of the presentation? We were catcalled throughout, being accused of being liars. The word scum. Was, was, was used. There was some obscene language towards us. You had the baying mob in full, in full cry. You get that in the House of Parliament. I mean, that's nothing, that's nothing new. <laughs> if they don't like what they've heard, I and mean, we had a meeting last weekend, and if, they, if our delegates don't like what they hear, they, they'll, 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 there's a rumble goes through, through the crowd. That's, that's straightforward. It became a witch hunt. It became a kangaroo court. I felt like you were talking to 80 people who were who would quite happily have strung you up. They knew then, I believe, that 
they were just bought there as being lambs to the slaughter. WDC and its players. You know, I don't know what, what it's on about. I mean, <laughs> I just saw a pig fly past the window. Um, Ollie, Ollie's fingerprints are all over everything that the big deal does. Nobody, but nobody, does anything without Ollie's consent. A man's an idiot if he thinks if he believes that, and it, everyone's an idiot. Everyone else, it, if anyone else believes it, well, God bless them. Yeah, they left, and the meeting sort of continued, but very, very much in a vein that we, you know, we sent them away with their towels between their legs. The delegates voted to ban Tommy and his star players from every darts competition in Britain. The most famous names in the history of the game were now outcasts. Even now, when I'm thinking about it, my stomach churns, because it was, it was stomach churning, um, the whole thing. The word ban became uh, the most used word in the Darts Dictionary. It was an awful, awful period. I, I hope never to go through anything like that again in, in my lifetime. They were absolutely, totally ostracised long-standing friendships over years years and years and years were were, were were strained dark playing partnerships in pairs that had been going for years and years were forced to be broken up in even in the minor little insignificant 100 pound competitions in a pub somewhere they couldn't they couldn't associate that's how deep it was um, and it, it must have been very, very difficult for the resolve of those players. Apart from the odd overseas tournament, these players were now cut adrift. Well, that was we all said we were going to stick together, and that was it. And then, they, then Ollie started his game plan, didn't he? And all he was going to do is try and pick us off at one at a time and destroy us. But that's the way he thinks. That's the nastiness in his head. You know what I mean? We knew what they was going to do, but we just didn't think anyone was going to, you know, anyone was going to get suckered into it. As the months passed, the ban put more and more pressure on the players' commitment to each other. Rumours of possible legal action made some of them especially nervous. what I was going to do. Then when they had to be told, they were told. I wouldn't mind if it is said to me, Eric, I'm going to go back to the BDO. They've offered me a good deal. I want to look after my wife and kids. I, I wouldn't have told the other boys. I said, OK, Michael, shook his hand. I said, you've got to do what you've got to do. I mean, and, and I still would have been friends with him. But he didn't do that. So I don't talk to him no more. But he should have told me. You don't share a room with somebody for two years. And do that. Oh, very pleased. I'm, I mean, he was, he's, he's, well, he's one of them players that have been around with us for quite a few years. Nice, nice bloke. By the time of Mike Gregory's defection, Tommy already had a new and potentially more devastating crisis on his hands. The darting nations of the world had gathered at the Las Vegas tournament for a World Federation meeting, and a terrible thought had occurred to Tommy. 
Just suppose Ollie Croft were to use his influence to extend the ban on players across the entire face of the earth. In a fit of desperate anxiety, Tommy booked his flight to Vegas. I think maybe at that time, Ollie did think that he would prevent the players from going to the Swedish Open, to the German Open, to the Belgian Open, to the Australian Open, um, and to the North American Inter Tommy's worst fears were realized. As he lobbied the delegates, he learned that a global ban was indeed on the agenda. The World Darts Federation was gathering the very next day, and the five most powerful darts chiefs on earth would decide the fate of Tommy and his new organization. I was pretty desperate. I talked till I was blue in the face to people um, outside lobbying um, and tried very, very hard to gain admittance. Holly Croft. And he is as powerful, if not more so, on the World Dance Federation than he is on the British Dance Organisation. Do you honestly think that the World Darts Federation containing Ollie Croft as the General Secretary is going to turn around to England containing Ollie Croft as the General Secretary and say, Ollie, you made a mistake? Never. Never. Never ever. If he couldn't get into the meeting to stop the ban, the choices for Tommy would be stark. He could concede all to Ollie or he could unleash a force that would sentence the game he loved to years in the doldrums. Litigation. At this crucial moment, on the horns of an agonizing dilemma, there appeared to Tommy a vision which would guide his next move and the future of the entire sport. Lorna just appeared like a bat out of hell as they say and she was livid you could see in her face she was livid I went up and I told him asked him what he was doing there I said you're not wanted by people why are you here just leave us alone it was words like that as short and sharp as that loud with you know the hurt and frustration she actually said uh, the fucking hell are you scumbags doing here? I would never have dreamt of swearing at that stage because I would have been lowering myself to their standard. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> she, she would never swear. Okay, well, if she says that, it must be right then. And, and I think I did cry after, you know, because it, <laughs> cause it was... A, I'd let off steam, yeah. It was a shock that I could do it. But I didn't, and that's how much I must have felt. And that was as near as we got to, to um, addressing the uh, meeting. With regard to the court case, Vegas was the last stop because then it made it inevitable because not only were we having problems in the UK, we were now assured of problems all over the world and that clearly had to be fought whatever the cost. There now began one of the most protracted legal battles in the history of British sport. Hundreds of thousands of pounds that the game could ill afford were lavished on a case that would leave darts paralyzed for years. If I feel sorry for anybody, I feel sorry for those young players um, that would have come through 
They would have challenged. They would have been the Bristows of the 90s. And they would have gone to these old fogey dark players who have been hanging around too long and I said, hey. And they, and they can never get that back. And as the lawyers locked horns, the world's top stars looked on and watched their best years drain away. Jockey is living 30 yards from where he originally started out on the same estate in Kilcoddy in Fife. He's never thrown a dart for three years, certainly. He's still a world-renowned face, as you can imagine. But I have to say, he's never been out of the house. And he's never been off these his housing scheme, as he calls it up there, has never been off there in two years. Even the game's undisputed superstar didn't escape unscathed. For some unknown reason, he got his diarrhitis. It's something in there, isn't it? It's, it's your brain, isn't it? And everybody says to you, just let them go. That's what they say to you, you go like that, you go, and you, and you just won't go. And everybody say, all your mates say, just let it go. They say, well, what bloody hell do you think I'm trying to do? You think, I want to stand here all day with this in my head, do what? Something to do with the brain cells, mate. The grey matter. Yeah, maybe that was stress, eh? Maybe that, well, I don't know. left the reputation of the game in tatters, lawyers advised the two sides to settle. Tommy agreed not to call his organization a world body, and Ollie lifted the ban on players. To be perfectly honest, I don't think either side ever construed it as being a victory. And if they had done so, it would have been a very, very hollow victory indeed. Tommy's Professional Darts Council now stages Sky TV's coverage. And Eric Bristow has recovered from dartitis. But the game still echoes with suspicion and mistrust. There are still a lot of deep, deep wounds there, which I felt personally. Through bloody-mindedness, or whatever you like to call it, um, They've cost the darts, darts in general, a lot of money. Until such time as Ollie moves aside or moves on altogether, um, there will never be complete harmony because the, he will always have that feeling that darts belongs to him. In a way, you feel it's your baby, you know. You know, you've sort of uh, been there for so long and all that. But the day I can't do it, and then obviously I'll, I'll put my fellow towel in, but at the moment I feel as though I've got a lot to offer. Positively. You need the buzz, you need the energy. Look and feel confident. That was fantastic. <laughs> Stay calm. She kind of ploughed straight in there. Focus on your body language. I'm stressed about presentations. She's thinking she can't do it. Play to your audience. She's being very concise. And smile. Just have a good time, alright? Make sure you've got everything you need to get.